Hello and welcome. This is Crime Watch, uh, even if it looks a, a little bit different, because our, of a strike, our studio is out of action, so we have to thank Grandstand for our temporary home this month. As always, though, the detectives behind us need your help, and they're waiting for your call. We've two full-scale reconstructions, and the number, 01811-8055. As yet, no dramatic results from our last programme. Our reconstruction of the murder of Dawn Ashworth, a 15-year-old schoolgirl from Enderby in Leicestershire, produced a huge response, but so far it's taken the investigation little further. Detectives are now pinning their hopes on genetic fingerprinting, a sophisticated blood test. 2,000 local men have been asked to come forward and be tested, and so far 90% of them have agreed. The results will be known in a few weeks' time. Police in Manchester have been processing calls about the armed raid on a securical van in Hyde back in November. One of the gang was disguised as a lollipop man. Well, as a result of the programme, detectives have so far only discovered where that school lollipop was stolen from. That despite a £10,000 reward for information. And we showed you how two women were travelling around the country posing as DHSS officials and conning old people into handing over their pension books. The investigators took over 150 calls and have been able to eliminate a number of suspects from their inquiries. In addition, they had several calls from people sensibly checking up on visitors who claimed to represent the DHSS. The police have been investigating various bogus officials, but so far there have been no arrests and the two culprits seem to be lying low for the moment. You may remember some holiday snaps of a man who was wanted in connection with a series of cheque frauds. Well, more than 20 people rang in who recognised him. As a direct result, a man has been arrested and charged with a number of offences, including conspiracy to handle stolen cheques and grievous bodily harm. Two months ago, we featured the case of a little boy from Lincoln who was befriended by a stranger and taken by train to Peterborough, where he was kept overnight. We showed a video fit and three Crime Watch viewers recognised him and rang in. Yesterday, at Lincoln Crown Court, the man pleaded guilty to abducting the child. He was sentenced to two years in prison. The judge said he was being lenient because the boy wasn't harmed, but a two-year sentence would be a discouragement to others. You may have seen in the papers how Crown Watch helped to catch a man wanted for an armed robbery at a bank. According to eight national dailies, the robber was watching Crime Watch in a pub and a detective who was also in the bar recognised him and immediately arrested him. Well, it's a very good story. Unfortunately, it's not entirely true. The man was in a pub and he was spotted by two detectives. But it was sheer coincidence that they saw him on the night of the programme. In fact, neither he nor they had been watching Crime Watch. Shame on them. Our first case tonight is a murder. John Gasper, a London restaurant manager, was killed just over 11 weeks ago. The manner of his death strongly suggests that somebody who knew him must have been involved in his killing. But tonight, detectives believe that viewers who may never have heard of John Gasper might be able to help discover who did kill him. Our reconstruction starts in the West End of London, where he worked. The Pizza Pomodoro in Big Street, London W1. It's on the north side of Soho, five minutes from Regent Street, and it's busy from lunchtime till late at night. John Gasper had several partners, but as manager, he virtually lived in the place. It was a year since he'd started there, and literally hundreds of customers, particularly the women whom he made a special point of talking to, would remember his chat and easy charm. John Gasper was something of an entrepreneur. During 1986, he'd been hoping to expand and had been looking for new businesses in London and beyond. He'd made inquiries in Hull and had recently visited properties in Taunton in Somerset. He used his Camden Town flat almost like a hotel. He rarely got home before 2am. He'd bring a carton of milk from the restaurant for breakfast, the only meal he ever ate there. The flat was comfortable and secure. He never felt the need to double lock the door. If anyone wanted to get in, they'd have to obtain a key. Penny for the guy! Penny for the guy! It's Wednesday, November the 5th, five days before John Gasper died. In Kensington High Street, West London, is Bannum's, the specialist locksmiths. Sometime that day, probably during the morning, an expensively dressed couple were waiting for service. 
Other customers might recall an argument one of the salesmen was having with a man who couldn't prove his identity. You can ring my solicitor. No, we need to see some proof of ownership before we can re-register. You can ring my estate agent. The couple seemed uneasy and rather self-conscious. An expensive beige car, perhaps a Mercedes or a Daimler, was parked outside. Someone wanted a duplicate key to John Gasper's home. Can I have a kick-up, please? Mm -hmm. I'll just take the registration for you. The letter of authority with Mr Gasper's signature on it was forged. But the man had one of Gasper's rate demands and his key. A second key was duly cut. Here's the rates demand and the registration card. If you could ask Mr. Gasper to complete it and post it back to us, and here's the key. Five days later, Monday the 10th of November, the day of John Gasper's death, Berwick Street Market in Soho. At about 5 p.m., Mr. Gasper popped out of the restaurant to pick up a suit from the dry cleaners. How's things? It's all right, thank you. Over the next couple of hours, he certainly went back to the restaurant, but it's still not clear whether he went anywhere else or met anyone else in that time. The Gardens Health Club in Kingley Street is a couple of minutes' walk from the Pizza Pomodoro. John was a regular client, and we know he checked in at exactly 6.50 that day. Great. Thank you very much indeed. John spent about an hour there. He used the sunbed every other day. As he was leaving, he bumped into a business associate, Doran Zilka. Just the man I was looking for. How are you? Fine, I'll just pop into the restaurant. I'm going around there now. Come with me. Fine. OK. Bye, Melanie. Bye. Thank you. The two men hadn't seen each other for a few weeks, and they had various joint business ventures to discuss. Zilka was there until about 10.30. During that time, he remembers John spending quite a lot of time talking on the telephone. And he also remembers something else John mentioned. Um, in fact, I'm leaving early because I've got to meet Apart from his intentions to leave early, John Gasper seemed his usual self. It was just a normal weekday evening at the restaurant. He ate just before midnight, and it was after that that he broke with his usual routine. Socky, I've got a very important meeting early in the morning and I'm leaving now. Can I have a pint of milk, Will you lock up, give the keys to Tiziana so that she can open in the morning? Yeah. All right. All right. OK. Yeah. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. He may have had two appointments then, one that night and one in the morning. If he did have a meeting planned for that night, police have never discovered where it was or who it was with. They do know he left in his partner's green VW Golf, which he often borrowed. His flat is in a small block overlooking Camden Road, about a couple of miles due north of Soho. From forensic evidence, it seems he could have got back there any time between 12.45 and 2 o'clock, and he was probably alone. His flat was on the third floor of Julian Court, and as he took the lift up, John Gasper probably had no idea that someone was already up there waiting for him. John Gasper was shot as he walked in the door. No one else in the block heard a sound. Detective Chief Inspector Ian Blair is investigating the case. First of all, what more do you need to know about where John Gasper went on the day that he died? We've looked into that day very thoroughly, Sue, but obviously there are gaps. He popped out of the restaurant from time to time. He made lots of phone calls, like the one that was shown on the film. And we need to know who he spoke to and who he saw when he popped out. Above all, however, what we really need to know is when he left that restaurant, 
where did he go, and who was he with? It looks as though he was probably alone and he drove home alone, but it might be that this meeting that we're missing was somewhere else, and he picked up his killer. So we're really very interested in anybody who saw John on that night. Right. Now, going back to November the 5th, Guy Fawkes Day, when somebody got a duplicate key to John's flat from Bannum's the Locksmiths, you need that couple to come forward. I need that couple to come forward. I also need everybody who was in Bannum's on that day. It may have been that couple who had the key cut. It may not have been. It may have been somebody else. So I need to know anybody who was in Bannum's on Guy Fawkes night. That rates demand was genuine and so was the key. How do you think they got hold of that? Well, it would have been possible to get hold of the rates demand from the communal sort of postal section of his flats and the key must have been stolen. But the letter, that was forged? Yes, that was forged. I've got it here. It's grey because it's been fingerprinted, but it's on white paper. And this letter here is not in Gasper's writing and it's not Gasper's signature. Now, it's possible that the Bannams end is something that Gasper arranged, but we don't know that, and it's a very, very important clue. It's unusual writing with the little circular dots on the eyes. Extremely unusual, and we'd like to hear from anybody who knows that writing. How much do you know now about John Gasper himself? Well, that's really the main point of the appeal, Sue. We've looked into this man's life. It's a very private life in compartments in which one compartment doesn't know another compartment. And in that life, there is nothing which gives an indication of why he was killed. This is a very premeditated murder. There's the key. There's the appointment to which he was obviously going. There's a diary that's missing. He wrote everything in that diary, and we have never recovered it. And it's likely that the appointment was in that. And what we're really looking for is what is it in John Gasper's life that we don't know about that has led to his death? Somebody wanted him dead, and they wanted him dead so badly they are prepared to go to these lengths. So I want to hear from anybody who knows John Gasper and who has not yet contacted the police. Mr Blair, thank you. And if you do, and if you can help, please call now on 01 811 That's 01 811 And remember, there are detectives from the case here in the studio, or you can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. And there are lines open now to the incident room in Kentish Town Police Station. Their number is 01 725 3782 or 3786. That's 01 725 3782 or 3786. Now to the incident desk, where we invite the police to appeal to you directly. Tonight, the see through watch that could solve a murder in Southport, the faces and voices of two armed robbers in Sussex, and the travelling con man last seen in Luton. Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. A cat burglar, well, actually a dog burglar, obviously saw last month's incident desk when I appealed for the return of five precious puppies from a kennel in Hampshire. The next night, a family in south-east London found a tea chest on their doorstep with a note which read, Call police, dogs on TV. The puppies, I'm happy to report, were reunited with their litter. In the first of tonight's cases, we'd like you to look at this watch. If you've come across one identical to it within the last five weeks, you could help solve a murder. 31-year-old Nigel Bostock was stabbed and strangled to death in his home on the evening of Friday, December the 19th. That's a Friday before Christmas. He lived alone in a bungalow in a village near Southport, Lancashire, and owned a shoe shop in Wesley Street in the town centre. Nigel Bostock was gay and may have been killed by someone who knew him. Whoever it was took 700 pounds of shop takings and some jewellery from his home. The watch was exactly like this. It's a Bulova Aquatron Space View, and this particular range was discontinued 10 years ago. It works on a battery, and Bulova, the manufacturers, believe it's the only transparent watch without a winder ever to go on the market. It's got a gold coloured bracelet with a steel back. We'd like to hear from anyone who's recently been offered one exactly like this. And we'd also like a young man called Carl to call us. He's got sandy collar length hair and he's slim. We know he was a friend of Nigel Bostock and we think he lived in the same area. Carl, if you're watching, please ring us. You could help solve this murder. Next, two men who are wanted for offences of theft and deception from Humberside and Lancashire to South Wales and the South Coast. Since August, they've travelled the country using stolen checkbooks and credit cards to pay for hotel rooms and hire cars. On October the 26th, the two men stayed at the studio pub in Luton.
but that afternoon they left rather hurriedly, one through a window at the back of the building. And at the same time, the manager found £3,000 gone from the office. But in their haste, the men left this camera in their room. The film produced photographs of two men who bear a striking resemblance to the two who left so suddenly. We obviously like to speak to these two. We think they may be called Graham and Anthony. If any hotel managers or car hire companies have seen them recently, or if you know who they are, give us a call. Next, an armed robbery just before Christmas at a building society in Shoreham in Sussex. There were two men, and the security video is the first I've seen with colour and a soundtrack. Get away from the counter. Get away from the counter. Get away from the button. Get away from the button. One of them had a gold-coloured handgun, and after collecting £1,600, they dashed out into the high street. There's a £1,000 reward in this case, so look closely. Do you recognise either of them? The white one was about 25, stocky and had a London accent. The second man was slightly slimmer and about the same height. If you've seen the two of them together, please ring us now. Finally, somebody watching must be wondering whatever happened to their dinner service. Well, here it is. This 20-piece set of Worcester porcelain is dated about 1770 and it's worth £3,700. It was recovered two years ago amongst a vast haul of stolen property in Cambridgeshire. £130,000 worth of pictures and furniture was returned to its owner, but nobody claimed the crockery. If the owner of this spectacular set is watching now, do get in touch with us, or we may have to sell it in aid of the police fund. And ring us if you can help with any of the other items on our incident desk. If that's yours or you think you can help, the number is 01811 01811 Now a rather cultured sort of crime, the theft of works of art. Art theft is a substantial industry. It costs the country millions of pounds a year in insurance claims and many of the stolen treasures go out of Britain to be sold on the continent. What's more, art crimes are notoriously difficult to solve. But we've selected three cases tonight where you really might be able to help. But first, a story that gives an insight into how stolen artworks are disposed of and how they might be found again. In December 1979, these two paintings, along with six others, were stolen in a burglary at Bewley in Hampshire. They're 19th century by Cooper Henderson, and the pair of them were worth £6,000 at the time they were taken. Within days of the burglary, the paintings were sold here at Bermondsey Market. It's one of the busiest open markets in the country, and the sort of place which inevitably attracts the latest, the less reputable as well as legitimate traders. In the case of the Coach and Horses paintings, they were sold literally from the back of a van to two Dutch antique dealers. From London, they were taken to North East Holland to an antique shop in Meppel. A private collector bought them there, and he took them to Sotheby's in Amsterdam for their opinion. They advised that the paintings would fetch far more in Britain, and so, nearly a year after the burglary, they came back across the North Sea and were put up for auction at Sotheby's in London. The day before they were due to be sold, the man who'd originally supplied them to the owner spotted them at a preview. They were in his catalogue. Here it is, and here are the paintings, lots four and five. They were withdrawn from sale, and the owner got them back. Now, there are two lessons from the Coach and Horses story. First, that a stolen work of art is rarely lost for good. It may well turn up in an open market within days of the theft, or perhaps mon months later, back on the auction circuit. The other lesson is that if you don't have a photograph, you may find it pretty hard to claim it when it does turn up. Now, the first case that we want you to help with tonight concerns this spectacular tapestry. It's one of an identical pair. Last Wednesday, thieves stole the other one. It's wool and silk, and it was made in Brussels 400 years ago. The current value of just one of these is 35,000 pounds. The other one was stolen from North Mim's house near Hatfield in Hertfordshire. The thieves got in through a second floor window and made their way to the long gallery, where there were five valuable tapestries in all. And maybe the sheer weight of the thing stopped them taking more than one. This is just the sort of thing that could be spotted before it goes abroad, and tonight, just eight days after the theft, we hope someone will do just that. Christie's tapestry expert, Hugh Roberts, believes it's so unusual, it'll be hard to get rid of. 
Well, it's one of a set of uh, very interesting tapestries from, uh, made in Brussels in the 17th century. Um, the, uh, the North Mims tapestries, which were sold at Christie's uh, in 1979, were exceptionally interesting because of the perfection of their condition. And this particular one showed Cleopatra kneeling before Caesar uh, and was of its kind uh, certainly one of the best 17th century tapestries around. The colours, unusually, were very, very well preserved indeed, and I think would be something that would be instantly recognisable to anybody who knew about tapestries or anybody who was even faintly interested in tapestries. Uh, it would be a matter of moments just to look it up in, 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 in our catalogue or indeed in any reference work and see exactly what it is and how important it is. Well, our second case is even more unusual. Last summer, the old council offices in Amersham in Buckinghamshire were sold, and the new owner was surprised to discover that a rather faded ceiling painting was by James Thornhill, an 18th century artist renowned for his work in St Paul's Cathedral. And then, during renovations, a whole number of other works by Thornhill were discovered on wall panels which had been covered with wallpaper. The reaction of the art historian Brian Allen? Well, one of astonishment, essentially. I've never seen anything like this in a, a small uh, house in the country. It's the sort of thing you normally find in the grandest country houses, places like Chatsworth and Hampton Court and so on, these decorative painters working at the very beginning of the 18th century. But I've never seen anything like this in a sort of merchant's house in the country. There were several mythological scenes. This one depicts Apollo and Daphne, and this one shows Europa and the bull. The delicate work of cleaning the panels had only just begun when, last weekend, someone broke in and jemmied out four whole panels. There's no telling whether the paintings were damaged in the process, but it appears that whoever took them has already tested the market, because on Monday, a dealer in the Portobello area of West London is sure he was offered this one. It was a bit smaller than the others, about three foot by two foot, and the man who had it was in his early 40s and about five foot five tall. He had a moustache, a London accent, and he was in a blue van. Like the tapestry, these panels are very likely to appear again somewhere in the next few days. Our third case involves deception. In London, over the past year, people posing as British telecom engineers have probably been responsible for thefts totalling over a million pounds. Pretty difficult for them to pull that one at the moment, of course, because telecom engineers are on strike. But last July, two men got away with a collection of about 50 miniatures. They're wonderful, tiny, oval-shaped paintings. They're watercolours on ivory. They range in size from one to three inches. They're mainly 18th century. The owner, who lives in a flat in West London, recalls what happened when the bogus phone engineers called round. Yeah, I said there was nothing wrong with my telephone, that it was working perfectly normally. He, the, the man, the one in front, then showed me his ID card, which very foolishly I didn't check out. I just sort of glanced at it. And they, they then came in and made it straight from my sitting room. They then looked up and looked around the room and saw my paintings, and particularly the portrait miniatures on my wall. The ones stolen were worth about £50,000. They were hung on open frames and therefore pretty easy to pocket. And they said, oh, you can't be too careful, you know, with burglars coming in with all this building work and the sort of... <laughs> then, then they said they'd better um, check the junction box, so they asked me to go and listen to the telephone in the bedroom whilst they did so. After a few minutes, I looked round, saw the front door open and... Uh, Thought highly suspicious, came through to the sitting room and found that my portrait miniatures had been taken in the space of just a very few minutes. And uh, there's been no trace of them since. Well, one man is trying to trace them pretty hard. It's John Souter. He was uh, the antiques officer for Hampshire Police. He's now an investigator for a firm of loss adjusters. They were stolen six months ago, those miniatures. Frankly, are, are people likely to see them? Are they likely to be on the market now? I think so. I think now is the time for these pictures to begin to surface on the market. I'm quite sure that somewhere, maybe yesterday or tomorrow or next week, may be offered these paintings. The collection may have been split up, but collectors all over the country ought to keep their eyes skinned for these. They're very pretty, very distinctive, very unusual. Now, the people who took them, obviously they weren't wearing balaclavas when they went in. They were posing as phone engineers, so that you must have descriptions of them. Yes, there are descriptions of these men. One is aged between about 35 and 40. Um, he is fairly well built with dark hair and a beard, casually dressed, 
um, but a sort of a working type. Some people I know said he had a moustache, so maybe those are false. Possibly be false, yes. And the other man? Now, his partner is a, is a more stocky chap, somewhat shorter than the first one, with fair hair, collar length, and he too was dressed quite well, but in casual clothes. Both of these men had London accents. Now, there's wonderful panels stolen from Amersham. I gather the BBC might be partly to blame for that. <laughs> they might well be. They were on the news. But we, we don't know, do we? Now, the thing is yeah. that um, they are very fragile and they are part of our heritage. And I would appeal to the man who tried to sell them in Portobello district, to if he still got them, to think twice about it, look after them and return them. Well, obviously, he's going to find it pretty hard to sell them now they've been on Crime Watch. You're saying for whatever you do, match to them. Don't put a match to them. And should any dealer have been offered them or may have bought them, please get in touch with us tonight. Now, the same must be true of the tapestry. That must be very hard to get rid of now. Where will that be? I think that that tapestry will end up in Belgium or Holland. And it may be on its way there tonight. So, once again, I appeal to people on official duties in ports and other places to keep their eye skin for cars and vans that may have property like this in it. Have a second look. Right. Well, of course, we have lots of viewers in uh, the Netherlands and in Belgium. If you're watching Crime Watch, do watch out for that tapestry. And if you've got any valuables, for heaven's sake, keep them under lock and key. Keep photographs of them and, if possible, fit an alarm. If you come across any of the pieces we've shown you tonight, or well, we've officers from various inquiries here to take your call. The number, as ever, 01811. 8055. Well, now for photo call, pictures of people wanted by the police. To take us through them, Helen Phelps and David Hatcher. First on tonight's photo call is Frank Paul O'Reilly. We need to speak to Mr. O'Reilly about a murder on Boxing Day at a party in Bermondsey in London. Clifford Harris, who was just 20, was stabbed in the heart and died on the way to hospital. Frank O'Reilly was the manager of the Duke of Kent Public House on the Old Kent Road. He's 31 and 5 foot 8 and has a London accent. He's likely to be in London or Brighton. But if you see him, don't approach him. He's a dangerous man. If you know where he is, or if you've seen him since Boxing Day, please ring us. Our second photograph is of Lytton Clinton Hamilton. We want to trace this man in connection with another murder in London. On the 15th of November last year, 21-year-old Victor Oddle was stabbed to death in Herbert Road in Tottenham. Lytton Hamilton is also 21. He's slim, and although this photograph doesn't show it, his face is rather pockmarked. We believe he's recently been in London or Birmingham. If you've seen him anywhere, please ring us straight away. Next, a man whose nickname is Scouse, who may but who may actually be a Geordie. We don't know his real name, but we think he may be able to help with inquiries into the murder of Terry Burns from Maidstone. Terry was stabbed to death by rival football fans at the Embankment Tube on October the 4th. Earlier that day at the Crystal Palace game against Millwall, a video was taken which shows Scouse on the terraces. Somebody must know who he is. He's thought to be in his early 20s and he's quite stocky. Ring us if you can help find him and don't forget, he could come from Newcastle. And this man may come from my own county, Kent. This was taken on November the 19th at a building society in Ashford. He waited till the coast was clear and then went up to the counter brandishing a sawn-off shotgun. As he did so, he looked straight at the security camera. He then went behind the counter, collected three and a half thousand pounds and left. If you recognise him or if you see him, please ring us. And call us if you can help us find any of the faces on tonight's photo call. If you do recognise any of those faces, the number to call is 01811 Now a film about a group of thieves who really are rather heartless, but who, with your help, could be caught in the next few hours. They specialise in attacking old people, and what's more, attacking them in their homes, something most criminals simply wouldn't stomach. Now please watch closely, because you might well recognise a face or some other feature of these crimes. Our reconstruction starts by the A1 in Cambridgeshire. The Brampton filling station, two miles from Huntingdon. Since the summer, three men in a green Cortina have stopped here regularly. They'd usually arrive between half past five and half past six and buy two pounds worth of petrol. From occasional remarks, it seemed that they might have been related and working in the area. Number one, please. Two pounds, please. Thanks. 
you today, then? Fine. Been a bit busy, though. Yeah? What you been up to? I've been around flogging pictures. Oh, I'll be some seats, aren't they? Right, I'll bring you some in for you next time. Yeah? Thanks. See you, then. Cheerio. They usually headed off towards Huntingdon. The filling station is here at the junction of the A1 and the A604. From Coventry, hundreds of door-to-door -door salesmen drive out into the counties to the east. Selling cheap paintings and prints in the small towns and villages has become a thriving industry here. No, I don't think so. I think I'll just leave it. Thurning is one such village. It's just a few miles from the A1. Reg and Alf Hull have lived here for 20 years. Ten miles away at Brampton at about six o'clock on Monday the 8th of December. The attendant recognised his regular customers and he noticed they had a new car, a P-registration Blue Avenger with a black vinyl roof. 9.30 in Thurning. Alf Hull was already in bed. His brother, Reg, was collecting coal for the morning. Reg was threatened with a knife and tied up. So too was his brother. Their ordeal lasted half an hour before the men left with their savings of £1,200. A few minutes afterwards, a hundred yards from the house, a motorist saw two men who appeared to be waiting for someone. Another witness heard that row and remembered that the car was a Blue Avenger with a black vinyl roof. There were house-to-house -house inquiries. Someone who worked part-time at the Brampton filling station also remembered a Blue Avenger. The garage attendants were asked to keep a lookout for the three men, but over the next couple of weeks, they didn't come back. Then, eight days after the incident at Thurning, there was another attack about eight miles away in Upper Benefield. At four o'clock, Radio Northampton News with Penny Young. A woman from Upper Bennyfield near Corby has been threatened and robbed by two masked men in her own home. Police the attack was similar to that in Thurning. Again, the break-in was at nine o'clock. 68-year-old Connie Lane was woken by the sound of breaking glass in her kitchen. She was threatened with a knife, and the men left with her 300 pounds of savings. And I handed up the money, and when they were getting through the window, they to to come out again they said um, if you put it in the papers we'll come back again you must have been petrified oh terrifying yes I was very very frightened indeed yeah police were sure the incidents were linked and they were even more anxious to trace the men at the garage by now they had a good description of the older one Quarter to nine, two days before Christmas. Hello? Is there a card tonight? Oh, yeah, we're part around the back. Yeah. Right, that'll be 42 pence, please. Thank you. Don't see much of you lately? No, we've been busy in other places. Bye bye. Cheerio. The attendant hadn't seen the teenager before, but he certainly recognised the older man. He watched to see what sort of car they were in. It turned out to be a yellow Austin Princess. He took down the registration number, but it seems the plates were false. Sunday, the 11th of January, Stoke Albany. Cecil Green is 81. He lives alone in a small cottage on Middle Lane. That Sunday evening, he settled down to watch television as usual. Mastermind of 1987. In 1807, which constituency was Cochrane returned as a member of Parliament with Sir Francis Burdett? Westminster. Correct. Which first Lord of... 
Hello, police emergency control room. Can I help you? Can you come to Middle Lane, Stoke Albany? My neighbour's been tied up and robbed. Been tied up? Yes, by two men in Balakal. Mr Green had had to cut himself free and he was very badly shaken. Police fear if there's another attack, someone could be killed. The crooks really are a particularly mean bunch. One of those victims was so frightened that she couldn't even bear to go outside and get help until it was daylight. Now, Bill Clark, you've got fairly good descriptions of some of these men, haven't you? Particularly the older one. Yes, we're very anxious to get these. We have good, good artist impressions of them that we got from the attendant at the garage. We were able to give these artist impressions to Crime Watch and they were able to put video fits to them, which enhanced them a great deal. This is number one, the elderly man who drove the vehicles. He's about 48 years of age. He's five foot six to five foot seven. Uh, medium build, dark wavy hair receding at the temples, and he would be normally wearing an anorak in jeans. Now, you call him elderly only in comparison to the others. One of them, yes. much younger, perhaps a teenager. Yes. The one on the left-hand side, the profile that you see, he's aged 18 to 20 years. He's got greasy, nearly brill cream hair, neatly cut. He was wearing a brown leather jacket and blue jeans, very tidy indeed. And on the right-hand side, we see a man aged 23 to 25 years of age. He has fair hair, untidy, usually wearing a jumper and jeans. And they could be, we don't know, but they could be art sellers selling these relatively cheap selling paintings. Selling these pictures. We've got to be careful on that point. We know there are a great number of our picture sellers in the area, but if anybody's been visited by picture sellers, especially having these vehicles we've mentioned, the Avenger, the Cortina, or indeed the Yellow Princess, and we're very interested to hear from those people to help us, yes. Right, but you don't just want calls from people because somebody has come trying to sell them pictures. It's got to be more specific than a that. A little bit more specific than that, because we know the area's been saturated with them. What else have you got to go on, though? We have a Polaroid photograph, which I'll show you. This Polaroid photograph was found at Therning, the first offence that was seen on the film. We believe, we're almost sure, it was dropped by one of the offenders. The old boys don't know who she is, nobody in the village knows who she is. Underneath the chair, in the corner of the picture, is a, is a, is a newspaper. This has been blown up, and the date revealed on it is the 31st of December, 1981, New Year's Eve, 1981. So that girl is five, six years older now. Somebody yes. must recognise her. She must recognise herself. She's unconnected yes. with the crime, of course. We believe she's totally unconnected with the crime, but we think she could lead us to the identity of the offenders. Very important. People should ring us up about that. Right. Well, would she please, please call us? And you've got a... Ten pound note here. What's the yes, point of that? Yes, the ten pound note. The thurning job again. We know that uh, denominations of this old money was taken from that house. It could be shown now these old people have kept money in the house for many, many years. And I'll take this opportunity to say, any elder people listening tonight, if you have money in the house, please lock it away in a bank. Put it into a building society where it's nice and safe. Papa, thank you very much. If you know who these men are, have any clues that could lead to them, please just call us, 01811 or you can call Northamptonshire Police on 0536 62661. That's 0536, the code for Corby, 62661, and please ask for the incident from. And the phones are busy already. We asked you if you could identify this distinctive transparent watch. It's a Bulliver and it's over 10 years old. And somebody called Philip rang. It's in connection with the murder of Nigel Bostock. And Philip from Torquay rang, but he was ringing on a charge card and it ran out before he could give us the details. So, Philip, do please ring us again. And also, we've been getting quite a few calls on the case of John Gasper's murder. He knew a lot of people. If one of those was you, please do call us. If you can't get through, or if you prefer not to make a long-distance call, just contact your local police or write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London W12 8QT. All the local numbers are on CFAX on page 186, and we'll be back with Crime Watch update at 10 past 11 tonight. Now, if you can't stay up till then, please don't be frightened by the crimes we've shown you. Hundreds of viewers are calling in right now to help, and we're working here with the police to try to solve them. So don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well. Good night. Good night.
Hello and welcome back. Now, these are the report forms, the things that people here, the detectives and BBC researchers, fill out if you call in. And frankly, we're getting swamped in paperwork here tonight. We've had so many calls. We've just about kept abreast of them here at the studio. Instant desks up and down the country, though, have frankly found it almost impossible to cope. If you've found the lines engaged when you've rung police stations, please do persevere. But we've had some tremendous calls. We've had people identified. We've had car registration numbers, names and addresses. Let's get you up to date quickly. So. Well, first of all, the murder of Soho restaurateur John Gasper. John was manager of the Pizza Pomodoro in London's Beak Street. On the night of Monday the 10th of November, he left the restaurant unusually early, about half an hour after midnight, having mentioned that he was due to meet someone. He was shot as he walked in through the door of his flat. His killer had been lying in wait. Just five days earlier, someone presented a forged letter of authority at Bannum's, the locksmith's, to obtain a duplicate key to John's flat. Detective Chief Inspector Blair, you seem to have had a lot of calls. I wonder how, many you, how much use some of them have been. We've had some very interesting and useful calls. So, in particular, a lot of people have asked to see the letter again uh, so that they can have a look at the writing and the signature in case they can identify it. We've also uh, had a possibility that we've uh, sorted out one of the appointments for the next day, uh, which is may have been with a life insurance agent. But in particular, I'm interested in two calls that we've had here at, at Crime Watch. The first is from a young lady who says that uh, John Gasper gave her a lift that night to Stoke Newington. We don't have a number where you can ring that lady, and I'd be very grateful for her to ring us back. Most importantly of all, though, we've actually had a call from a man naming himself as Pizza. Now, I received that call myself, and uh, I would be very, very grateful to receive that kind of call again so that I can get more information about John Gasper. I know you have had some names and you're checking those, but could you remind us again what you're looking for? Yeah, the three points are, the first is, did anybody see John Gasper that night? The second is, was anybody in Bannum's on that day, the 5th of November, when the key was cut? And the third and most important of all is, does anybody know John Gasper and who has not yet contacted the police? A lot of people did. Let's hope they do. Thank Thanks. you, Mr Blair. Now the gang that have been robbing elderly people in Northamptonshire. Three men have been seen at a garage on the A1. They may have been involved in the attacks at several nearby villages. Something they said there gave a hint as to their identity. How are you, Sailor? Fine. Been a bit busy, though. Yeah? What have you been up to? I've been around flogging pictures. Oh, I've been six, have I? Right, I'll bring them in for you next time. And the second crucial clue was a Polaroid photograph. Well, always, always will happen to you, but some of you now, this is the photograph. And uh, we're not going to show too much of it again now in detail because the woman almost certainly has been identified. We've had, I think, 15 calls, Bill, who have rung up, all giving the same name for this woman. Yes. Now, she has nothing to do with the crime, as far as you know, but this picture was left behind at the scene of a crime. That is correct. Even her mother has rang in to identify her as a daughter. Right. We've now sent detectives along to see this lady to see if we can confirm that. Right. Now, you've had so many calls. I know you haven't yet been able to yes. read all the report forms. No, it's tremendous. We're getting a good response from the public. I'll reiterate what you say. Keep ringing in, even though the phones are engaged. Bide your time. Be patient. Please keep ringing. Now, you've got registration numbers galore. You've got details of, of names yes. and addresses galore. Yep. Clearly, you've got a lot of calls, too, from members of the criminal fraternity. This was a particularly horrible crime, attacking old people. That is true. We've had uh, lots of calls from them. They don't like this type of crime against defenceless old people. They understand the dangers, their health. They think about their mothers in this situation. Let's have the calls. OK. Well, Clark, I'll give you the rest of these to get through. Thank Lovely. you very much. Thank you. Well, now to see whether we've had any luck in tracking down that uh, tapestry or any of the other works of art we were looking for. Mr Souter, possible good news, I gather, on the miniatures which were stolen by bogus telephone engineers. Yes, this is all getting very exciting, actually. Um, we've had calls from all over the country, including the south of England, London and York, from various collectors, dealers, who have spotted miniatures of th like this being offered for sale at various antique markets in the country. Please keep ringing. There's one particular... All these calls are being followed up. One particular call I would like to remark about it was from a gentleman ringing from the Hook of Holland who said that only last night he was offered some paintings of people under suspicious circumstances. Now, would he please ring again? Now, they uh, could be the miniatures or they could be the wall panels, they? They could panels, be the miniatures or the panels, but we would like him to ring again to clarify what he was offered. Any news on those wall panels? Um, 
not exactly on the panels, but the, the van in, involved. Um, last Monday, we have a report of a blue van calling at a filling station on the North Circular Road near the Winchmore Hill Junction. Uh, the driver inquired of the, uh, of the attendant that directions to Portobello Road. This has been followed up at this right. moment. And briefly, nothing under the tapestry, but you're convinced it's going to end up in Belgium or Holland. Somebody sometime. knows where it is. I'd like them to get in touch tonight. Yes. We're sure all these will surface sooner or later. Mr. I'm sure Sutton, they will. Thank you very much. Thank you. This time last month, we had a rather disappointing number of calls on incident desk and photo call, but uh, this time we've got stacks. Here's Helen Phelps. Helen, first, that murder of uh, Nigel Bostock in, in Stockport. What do we know about that? There have been many calls, mainly about Carl, and to the relative of Carl who rang in starting to give his whereabouts, I appeal to you, please call again. Right. The robbers who went into the building society in Shoreham had the misfortune to be videoed by a camera which was in full colour and took sound of their voices. Twenty calls have come in about this robbery. One of them was from a young woman who rang Shoreham CID. She seemed to know these men. The CID officers are asking her to call again. Their number is 0273 454 521. And lots of calls I know on that it was a burglary, not a robbery, a burglary in Luton where uh, it was a hotel and one of the villains actually leapt out through a window to get away. Well, these have generated a lot of calls, giving names and addresses of the men. What one photograph didn't show that the dark-haired man had a tattoo on his chest and fingers off his left hand. This photo, I should say, was processed from a camera they left behind at the scene of the crime, rather foolishly. And that's right. Well, anyone, if anyone does recognise these two, particularly with that mention of the tattoos, Please call again. Right. You haven't by any chance managed to find who owns that porcelain that was recovered, have well, you? Well, we have. A woman from Norfolk has rung in. It's been in her family since the Second World War. But it, well, it was stolen from her home in 1978. And since then, she hadn't seen hide nor hair of it till now. Nice well, smashing news. Alan, thanks very much. And any news on our photo call this week? Yes, Sue, there's a lot of hope there. Frank O'Reilly was the first face we dealt with. He was being sought in connection with a murder which occurred on Boxing Day. We've had three good calls on him, one of which gives us a means, we hope, of getting back to him. Secondly, we dealt with Lytton, Clinton, Dave, uh, Hamilton, again a murder suspect. Possible sightings again and something that fits in with something the officers here already know, so they're hopeful. Thirdly, another murder, Scouse believe possibly to have a Geordie accent. We've got four possible names there, and two anonymous women have called in giving the same name. So we're hopeful. Lastly, our Ashford Building Society robber. Well, another anonymous caller has called in and given us a name. We'd like any callers who've given us names on all these people to call again, please. Everything will be treated in the strictest confidence. Well, thank you, David. And that's it for this month. The police, of course, will be continuing to work on all tonight's cases and will tell you next month of any further developments. The main number here in the studio stays open from now until midnight and we'll give you a list of local numbers in a moment. So anyway, we're still getting a lot of calls in from the continent, a lot of calls from people who are getting local numbers of incident, desk, uh, incident desks from uh, BBC CFAX. Thank you for watching, thank you for calling if you did, and if you're heading off for bed, please don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.